Hello everyone, welcome to Game of Power. Today is episode 5. You know, we've been doing this for a little while. I I just kind of love this show. I love this outlet to see people come on and talk and just get to learn. So, pretty excited. I actually wanted to start today's episode with the news. Something that happened recently was Elon Musk decided to not buy Twitter. And so, I kind of wanted to talk about that. So, a couple, a couple months ago... Elon Musk wanted to buy Twitter. And so he proposed a $44 billion offer for Twitter. And there was a few reasons why I think he wanted to buy Twitter. Twitter is a big media company at this point. And so it is like the town square. And so as someone that has a lot of power, I think the media company being more like a town square is something that he wanted to do with Twitter. And so what he actually did was he tried to buy Twitter and take Twitter private. And the difference between private and public companies is that public companies have to deal with shareholders. And so they, when they have all this moderation going on, it's hard for the shareholders to kind of rally behind them. And so everything fluctuates a lot. They wanted to kind of buy Twitter and take Twitter private so that he can kind of do more with it and not have to put so many rules around it. And so I think that's interesting in terms of making Twitter a little more open to free speech. So yeah, he tried to he tried to buy Twitter and it honestly didn't work. What happened was Twitter has a lot of bots. And so people make not only bot accounts, but spam accounts and kind of start typing on there. And so he couldn't figure out how many actual users were on Twitter. And so that really has everything to do with the valuation of the company. And so when they try to go and offer 44 billion, if he's like, yo, 10% of the users on here are fake, then obviously the valuation's a lot different. So they're trying to kind of weed that out and figure that out. But I just definitely think that there is, there's a lot of potential in his acquisition of Twitter. We have to kind of see where that's going to go. So I'm very interested to see if Elon's going to end up pursuing is going to be with Noah. Um, Noah is a rapper. He's an artist. Yo, what's up, bro? How you doing? Okay. Yo, you can hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it going, bro? How you doing? Can you hear me? I'm chilling. I'm chilling. I'm in the studio right now. Let me go inside. I'm in the studio it, right now. That's what's up. How's it been making music lately? I know you, you grew up make, playing basketball. You just moved out to L.A. So you making music. What got you uh, into music? Um, well, really, so I had, you said mentioned playing basketball. I transferred to schools playing ball. And then, like, my second my second year at that new school, I ended up in the studio with my friends. And I made my first song. And then it's crazy because I kind of dropped basketball. Like, let me get in some good lighting. I kind of dropped basketball, uh, like, all together for music. But, you know, I came to my senses. I, I uh I picked up the ball again, picked up my shoes again. Now I'm in L.A. hooping and making music, you know. So now okay. I'm in L.A. making better music with better equipment, better people, you know, making my connections, but still hooping too for real, for real. That's amazing, bro. That's amazing. So yeah. I actually was just in Connecticut with Rob for the weekend. I seen like, that. I hadn't been, I hadn't really been out there in a while. So it was, bro, it's yeah. so good being where you're from. Tell me this, what's the biggest difference between Connecticut and L.A.? Like, how has that affected like, like music and basketball for you? Um, everybody out here really focused. Like everybody out here, if they do have a nine to five, they got something else on the side that they do even more. They do double. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, at home, you know, everybody kind of just grind to get by. But out here, it's kind of like it is some privilege. It feels like some privilege. You know, I'm in college and shit. Like, whatever. But people got that time to um really focus on what they want to do, and it's all ambitious. It's all about, you know, it's all about goals. It's all about goals out here for real. For real. I definitely feel that. I, I feel like that's like kind of the DMV in New York for me. Like when I'm out in New York, I'm like, man, this is, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of different things I'm motivated by. Yeah. Do you mind uh, switching out real quick? Just make sure the audio is good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, I do have a couple questions about that because I, I want to uh, hopefully like the main goal of that and main selling point for right now is for the investors to end up be able, being able to get a tax write off on the investments or something like that in the company, if that's possible. Because, you know, I already have investors, but it's not like official through an LLC or organization. Um, so I wanted to see if I can make it more efficient economically by making yeah, it more. That makes sense. Well, the first, the first thing I think that you're doing right is you should definitely separate, you know, your artist business from, you know, your personal business, your personal finance, yeah, even, even off rip, like whether, whether or not you get an LLC or not, like you should have money for your music and keep yeah. that separate than your money from your, from your personal so that, you know, you can use that music money to grow, invest in yourself. And so yeah. whenever you make money, you'll get, you'll get it into there. And then whenever you go pay a graphic designer, whenever you get a studio session, Whenever you kind of move around the industry and pay for different things, use your music money to do yeah, that. Facts. Like you never want to, you know, you don't want your art, your art stuff being mixed up with your personal life. So I think. And right now, you a, know that it's all personal money going into that shit. That's how, it, that's how it's been the past couple of years. So I definitely got to get that more organized. Like. Most definitely, because then you'll have then you'll have times where you know you'll want to do certain things, and it's like, oh man, you know, now I'm not able to pay for the stuff in my music. So it's like, make sure you know that the first, even like with fashion, I tell fashion designers. First thing you should do is separate your bank account, you know. So yeah. after that, like, there's a lot of different types of companies. So I am not mainly familiar with LLCs, but I am familiar with C-Corps a little bit more. So FITS is a C-Corp. And the difference between C-Corps and LLCs is that a C-Corp can issue shares to investors. And so companies like facebook back in the day you know you know um how like that guy got ripped out of facebook and you're like oh well, what happened how would he ever be able to do that so facebook started as a llc but when mm -hmm. they wanted real investors they had to become a delaware c corp and when they did that they kind of get that got that guy to sign you know be yeah. at the work and, and mess them up so i think so c corps are able to issue shares to investors so mm -hmm. i'm not sure necessarily if record labels are c corps or llcs i'll definitely mm -hmm. have to plug you in with people that know a little bit more about that but Such. yeah no i definitely think like the first thing is just like obviously yeah getting getting your business right and it starts with a mindset of like this is my music this is my personal life yeah no cap that's definitely what I've been on. Because you know you hit them hard times in your personal life. The music can't struggle and shit. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I also, it also get complicated because I have a lot of, um, because music is expensive for real, for real. Like everything you do in music, someone else got to get paid for it. So I do, like I'm not doing it all on my own. I got people that I've met. I've done some networking and got some money from them. So I got to definitely have it, um, be able to be organizable and traceable and accountable and stuff, you know? Yeah, for um, sure. Tell me this: what's the what's the hardest part about the music industry? Or getting into the music industry, I'm curious. What's the hardest part? Uh, well, for me, it was the internet because you can get led wrong so easily on the internet. Like for two years, I didn't really know what I was doing, and you just meeting people that you're not meeting face to face, and you like, especially if you're recording in your own home and you're doing everything on the internet, because you can have a whole music career only on the internet. It's hard to find mm. people you trust. It's hard to find hard to find real information because there's so much information out there. You're gonna hear three three people saying three different things about the same topic, about like answering the same question three different ways. Uh, for me, it was definitely the internet. So, like in person connections and doing shit in studios and you know what I'm saying, developing real friends. That like it's about the music first. It's not about nothing else but the music. Like having a concrete tangible thing that we're working on that's been the most important thing for me because otherwise okay. you're gonna get led wrong real easy way. that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense yeah. I, I was talking to this kid in fashion the other day and i was like so like you know do you, what do you need help with navigating he's like honestly there's too many resources so it's hard to kind of figure out and decipher what i actually should do because you can get to all the information at your hands but how can i filter this down into a, a navigational place where i can understand exactly especially when all them resources for music is like, here, let me promote your shit. Let me promote your shit. Just give me $30. Just give me $25. But all of a sudden, you got bots on your account. You got them fake Twitter accounts on you. You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, you're hurting yourself in the long run. Like, like that's only part of it. You know what I'm saying? Everybody asking for money because everything is money in the music industry. And then, like, most of them people, if you meet them on the internet, you don't even know. If, you know what I'm saying? Like, everything on yeah. the internet can be fabricated. So, I don't know. Yeah, I'd be like, hey, Boogie, I'm not, a, I'm not an internet person. 
definitely appreciate you for hopping on the show. Is there anything Thanks. else you wanted to tap into or talk about? Anything you wanted to promo? Um, no, I'm good for real. Tap in with Max. Tap in, tap in with Fitz. Uh, Visions by Rob came out today. Go get those. That was actually, bro, let me tell you some shit. That was the first um, Vision by Rob's thing I caught for myself for real, for real. Oh, for Today, real? this morning, I woke up, bought that shit. Yeah, that $40. How was, that, how, how was it? Like, how is it seeing him as a designer? Like, what do you, what do you think about Vision by Rob? Um, the glasses themselves, iconic. Duh. But Robinson himself is the real icon. You know, I've been seeing this growing for the past, like, six years or so. And this is, what, his third drop, fourth drop almost? Like, yeah. This shit real, bro. This shit just what we do at this point. It's kind of regular, but it's also like he meeting the standard of excellence. There is a standard of excellence, but he meeting it every time, so we're not even worried. Most definitely. But you know what you know what I like? Like Rob's first drop is like mm-hmm. even the reason why I feel like I'm back in the business and like doing entrepreneurship. There's a there's something about your friends around you that like doing that when shit. they're pushing up and they're like, you know, loving and stuff, you're like, Man, you know what, I gotta go. I gotta go up and level up. Niggas wanna I join in on that like, shit. It's like, it's so fire when you and like all your friends can all level up together, like learn yep. from each other, push each yep. other, grow with each other, because like that's really all that, that you know what I mean? It's like, it's oh, real you family push me shit. to do this, I push my friends to do this, like, and we just keep going. Like, that's something that, you know, I, I love everything you're doing, I love everything Javi's doing. I feel like we all just kind of push each other, bro. Facts, facts. Conversations like this and shit. Everything. Most definitely. Most everything. definitely. Tell me this last question. What is you something could. that you want to tap into? What is something that you want to learn about? Like in music, we always in, in uh, fashion right now. We've been talking about using your left hand. Like right uh-huh. now, we we have strengths on our right. Like, and if we turn to that left side, we can get to the basket, and and it opens up a whole new world of opportunities. For me, that's uh-huh. been programming. What do you think is like your left hand? What's something that you want to get into or learn more about? I'm definitely about to get into this um this financial this financial company shit because if I could. Like, I, I've been in this long enough to know where I need to put my money, but if I could, like, really get the money, because, like, I bet you know this, like, it's easier to get money when you're organized and when you have something to, like, show for it. So if I could really get a plan together, um, a cohesive plan together for my next couple drops and then have a structure where I could build off those um, and track the growth, um, that's definitely what I'm trying to, that's what I'm working on right now. Because the music that's always funny. coming. I'm always writing that shit, so. Most definitely, most definitely. Yeah. I just, I, the last thing I was trying to say to answer that is like, a business is something that helps people. You know what I mean? Yeah, if you can real. provide people a good product or a good service, something that can either save them time or solve big problems for them, then you can have a good business. You know what I mean? And so take yeah. it small, treat it small. Like everybody, everybody has like, we all have like a huge idea of where we want to take everything. One thing that I'm trying to learn about is how to, take things and like build on it piece by piece a little bit better you yes. know what i mean take that yeah. big vision and, and, and put that those pieces break together, it up and develop yep. mo- exactly start mm-hmm. a little bit smaller instead of being like yo i want to do all of this like big old do a few things right yeah. you know what i mean so that's definitely kind of where, where i want to get better at but nah bro whatever you whatever you want to tap in like i would love you for you to keep coming on the show keep tapping Thanks. into your music Keep Thanks. going, bro. And so we'll definitely we'll definitely keep it up. But I appreciate for you sure. for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, bro. Alrighty, man. Talk All to right, Woody. Yep. Okay. We are gonna have on Shivy soon. Hi, mom. <laughs> All right. So wait, I was talking about Elon Musk in Twitter, and I actually never got to finish that. So. Now that we edit and record, like, I can cut this up and be fine. Okay, so Elon Musk is now saying that he doesn't want to buy Twitter. And so he doesn't want to buy Twitter because there is a lot of bots or a lot of spam accounts on there. And so when you would say, okay, we can value Twitter at $44 billion if 5 10 15% of their entire uh, user base that, they, that they're claiming is bots or spam accounts, then they're not going to be able to justify that valuation and so it's going to be really interesting to see where twitter goes from here i think the reason why elon musk would be a good person to buy twitter is because elon musk is a product person and so when they asked like what would your role be in twitter as ceo he was like i'm gonna drive the product like i do for the rest of my companies um to kind of talk about that like what a 
a CEO that's a builder does is drive product. And so like one thing that oh should be drawn. One thing that I didn't know is like is like he his job at Twitter is going to be to drive the next version or next iteration of Twitter. And so yeah, we're gonna see if he buys it or not, but we'll just I got I guess I have to wait. I'm excited to talk to Chevy. Chevy is gonna come on talk about writing. I want to talk a little bit about NYU. Yo, hi. Hi. What's up? How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for for coming on the show. Of course. I've been waiting. I've been wanting to have you on for a minute, and I actually wanted to start by talking about NYU. Like okay. we are like we're like obviously seniors now we've been here for a minute but a lot of people are about to come to NYU for the first time and like how are you like i just like we started talking a little bit before school started but like what were your thoughts about coming to new york coming to NYU and what would you say to like the kids that are going to come next next fall oh my god we did talk before school started that's hilarious um probably like enjoy the, as much as you can your first year like don't worry about school don't worry about shit just do exactly what you do exactly what you think college should be like like your your vision of what you want for your semester just do exactly that that's what i would do. no i definitely and i think i think that starts at welcome week and like to to just kind of talk about like welcome week is when you guys first get to nyu you're gonna go through a week of like activities Party. of no school of parties. Like there's not like you just come on. To, you're gonna come to New York for Welcome Week, and you're just gonna have a week of no school. What like what's the, what did you take away from Welcome Week? Like what 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 energy do you think is there? Like what would you have to say to to that and those kids? I was surprised at how little sleep I could function on. <laughs> yeah, that was basically. <laughs> Like, it was, I mean, we used to be up to, like, what, 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and then we'd, like, get up at 10 and do it all over. Yeah. So, yeah. it was an experience. Moving around. I loved Welcome Week, though. It was really fun. I feel like I met so many people during Welcome Week, and I was, I just became friends with so many people, and then it's helped. Like, I feel like I've kept, I have kept relationships with a lot of people that I've met since day one. Till now. No, most definitely. Most, even us, like we met, we met day one. So, I know. So, 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 so over the time, you've you've switched up your your major a few times. You you've gotten into a few different things at NYU. Kind of talk about that, like you're coming in and like how, where you are now, like different career paths or different majors, different schools at NYU. Yeah. Okay. So I first started off wanting to be a journalist, and then I realized journalists don't make enough money. So uh, my major is media c culture and communications and it's a good major to go into because it's very broad. Like I'm doing a business analyst role right now for my internship and like I, I learned barely anything about business, you know, but like they see media and communications and they're like, oh, okay. So I think it's like a really versatile major. And then my minors, I've been switching for like switching in and out every single year, but Right now, I'm minoring in Spanish, um, business, music, and technology, and creative writing. So three minors. Okay. Wow. Yeah. And so tell me this: like you are just a, you've been very creative. You've been writing for a long time. Like I love your stories. I've just started tapping into books, and like I never really read books like that growing up. Like for some reason, I just like I it, I was always told like I couldn't read. So I just wasn't really interested in them. So I've been reading The Alchemist. I read Ender's Game just now. I never read Ender's Game before. It's one of the best <laughs> books I've ever read. I got Slaughterhouse Five. Put me onto a book. Like you, you, what, like what's going on? Like what, what different books? What, what's your favorite book? Um, and like what are different right. writers that that you like? Okay, called, what is that? It's called The Secret History by Donna Tart. My favorite book is um. The Secret History, no, yes, it's called The Secret History, like this book, but it's a, by a different author, and it's about Genghis Khan, and it's really, okay. um, but it basically kind of teaches you that, like, what the West has taught everybody else about 
people from the East is so wrong and biased and that history itself is just biased in general. So you really have to look at everything from a very like objective point of view and say like, mm -hmm. okay, that happened, but also who's the person writing the history right now? Like who's in charge? Are they really writing it right? And you know what I mean? Things like that. So Most I, feel like, definitely. I feel like that changed my view on a lot of things. That was like around the time with about like George Floyd too. So I was like, really just like thinking about how, how like messed up histories have become because of like who the people of power are in and what they decide to tell the narrative as, you know? That's mad important. I didn't even really think about it like that in terms of it, it really does come down to who the writer is because they have their own point of view. You know what I mean? And so they're the, if they're the person running it, they're the person distributing it, that's kind of coming from whatever they see that as. So that's definitely... You can't, you can't create something of your own without having some sort of bias, you know? It's just like, unless you're taking it straight from facts, even then I feel like you can still portray facts in a biased way, you know what I mean? So... Yeah, no, that's definitely... Like, we obviously we didn't learn a lot in, like, our history as children about anything that happened right so like i think it's important to read books to educate ourselves on different people's point of views so that you can be more open and you know kind of just try and understand everybody most definitely i think books not only help me understand other people it helps me understand how i think about certain things oh, i think yeah. like that's it like definitely because it's like you're reading it from this point of view so it's like however you take that like me and miles both read the same book the other day and we thought two completely different things about it and it's like i think that there's a different there's a real art in that you know yeah that's so fun i mean do you remember when you read my piece and like you got a completely different meaning from it than like what i had intended and yeah got a different meaning from it too so let's jump into that a little bit like what <laughs> take me to the origin story of that piece obviously there's something that we kind of wanted to figure out but like what, what what's the history of of the secret fits real x chevy piece okay well i can only write what i know about and that's how i feel like i've tried to write about things that i don't know and from per people's perspectives like i try and write from a boy's perspective sometimes just to challenge myself but this piece was really like personal i feel because i it was the first time i had like put myself into a story and kind of try to make it, I don't know, like make it alive, if that makes sense. You know, like give it essence, give it a story, give it a meaning, give it a theme, everything like that. But basically the story is about a girl who is addicted to drugs, but you don't really know that until the very end of the story because it's depicted through a different person. It's complicated, but yeah, <laughs> that's basically what it is. That is, that is so fire. And you know what, I actually, I definitely think the, the whole time, yeah, you don't see it. You see the, you see the different trauma, like, you see, like, the different cues of it. But like, yeah, you're right. Like, I, ne you, de you go through the whole story, and then you sit there and realize that. So tell me this, when it comes to writing, how, mm -hmm. how do you think people, and like, this is something that I'm trying to figure out, like, how do people write about an experience that so many people might have and see from so many different points of view but then tell it in like a like what are the basis of storytelling how does that work like what have you learned about that um honestly research like when i wrote my piece about um this mormon man who turned into like a sex slave anyways but i had to do a lot of research on like their religion, the type of people. I watched like so many YouTube videos, just seeing how the people talk, you know? Same thing goes for the first story that I talked about is um, it's like a lot of research seeing how, I just talked to my friends, right? Like, what are your experiences doing blah, blah, blah. And they would tell me, and everyone has different experiences. Everyone expresses them in different ways. So it's important to ask around. Like, this is another thing that's important from journalism. Journalism, you're telling someone else's story, right? You not, you're yourself into their, you're just helping them and like raising them up into um, the media. But it's the same thing for stories too. Like you need to, you can tap into your own experiences for sure, but you definitely need to 
be able to understand other people and their views on the subject before you can start writing about something like that. You have to know what you're writing about. Like you have to know exactly what your book is going to do. What your what you what do you want your story to do? That's the question you have to ask at the beginning. Like what do I want this paper to accomplish? What do I want this to accomplish? And then from there you can move on. Like oh, I want to tell a story about um, sexual assault, right? So then you like you go and you talk to people that have gone through some shit, you know, and you get their perspectives and you watch videos and you just come up with your own kind of characters in a way and you can base them off of real, peop real people and you can also not. The thing is you can create a character that's completely different from what the norm is and that can be interesting too, right? So, yeah. Wow. Okay, wait. Okay, that that makes okay. Wait, no, I definitely want to unpack that a little bit. I definitely want to unpack that a little bit. So you begin almost with the end in mind in terms of you have, like you said, you have to know what you have to accomplish. From yeah. there, what is like in the middle of knowing what you have to accomplish and starting on a story, and then like finishing a story that has some form of conclusion that somebody would understand. Okay, so you know how you were talking about how fits, it was like, what problem are we trying to solve? It's kind of the same thing. What problem am I trying to solve? What am I trying to, what do I want people to get out of this? So then I write down like the brief, like what I want people to get out of it. And then I go from there and I start brainstorming just so many different things. Like my pages when I first start writing are just 20 pages of like nonsense of just like different ideas that I have and then I pick out the ones that I like and then you have to map it out so you always have to map out your story because like you want everything to connect you want everything to be like oh like that's what they were talking about the whole time you know what I mean so you really have to think through it's a real, it's like a process you can't just start writing and then like continue like JK Rowling when she wrote Harry Potter like she knew what she was gonna do at the end of the book series before she started writing the first book and I think that's important and I think that honestly, everyone has different writing techniques. Like everyone writes in different ways, but for me, it's just word vomit and then piecing together what I think will work. And then it's like connecting puzzle pieces almost. Like, okay. like how can I make this storyline fit into this storyline? And then how can I make them work together to, I don't know, like share what I want to say, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think there's a lot of conflict resolution within the story as well. I am actually, um, so I'm, I sat down and I saw my blog the other day and I realized, man, you have all these different like blog posts. And I'm like, this is like the foundation for a book. And so I'm about to go and take all of those blog posts. I have a few different things that I want to do, but like Game of Power, that's this show, is also going to be called the same, like that's going to be my book. And so there's like a lot of different tenets of like the pieces of the game of power that like I have conveyed, but I'm trying to figure out how to take like the rough theme of each chapter and then turn it into like some form of story. I don't know if I want it to be like told for me. I want to tell other people's stories in different ways. So like I want to find a way of kind of delivering the information, but I'm not necessarily sure if I want to do it like in a real way or if in a, in a story way or if yeah. in a multiple interview way, so that's kind of what I'm trying to decipher now. So I think that's a little interesting. One thing that I do when I don't know what to do with my writing is I try each every way. So like try from this person's perspective, try it from this person's perspective. So I think maybe you could, you know, goof around with whatever you have right now and see like, Oh, do I like this being sort of a told in a story format where people can imagine their own characters in their heads? Or do I want this to be an informational book where I can help people, you know? So it's yeah. also on your purpose. So your book, it's gonna collect all this like great information and knowledge that you've collected, but what is the point of it, you know? What do you want, people, when people read it, what do you want them to get from it? That's like your first question. And then, since you already have your content, that's not the issue. The issue, and even the way you tell your story isn't the issue. It's really just finding out your issue, like what people, what you want people to know and then how to reiterate, reiterate that to them in a way that 
is personal and also like relatable yeah no most definitely thank you thank you so much Shibby. thank you so much for, for being on the show dropping all these writing gems like honestly i, I learned so much about because it's i i didn't even think about there's so many different factors in this and i think authenticity i think knowing the story knowing what you're doing also like you said starting with the end of mind and kind of having a real purpose like i love how you compare it even storytelling to fits in terms of it is solving a problem like you're yeah. solving a problem it's conflict resolution so no i just i i thank you for all that just is there anything else you wanted to to say or, or promo or shout out before uh before we step up um i don't think so but if you guys have anything you want to learn about writing let me know <laughs> already already well Shivy, thank you so much i definitely am excited to see more pieces come from you and yeah. honestly like you're just you're amazing you're talented uh best of luck and just keep going i'll see you soon i will see you soon yes, miss sir. you miss mm -hmm. you too Shivy. bye uh, thank you so much oh okay all right i mean like we're we're kind of chilling uh, I we could keep going, but I don't I don't know. I think I'm, I'm gonna see if mom wants to hop on. Mom, do you wanna hop on? Do you wanna hop? mom? This would be in the world to me if you came on. I'm not gonna lie, like, I would cry. If you can, you can say no. You can. Oh man, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. I don't know if mom's gonna come on. I miss you though. I love you, mom. All right. Well, I think we'll 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 end the show here. I honestly. I'm I'm interested, you know. I'm interested to keep doing this show. I I want to have a lot of different people. And we're moving game of power from power struggle movement to fits. The truth of the matter is, fits and the power struggle movement are the same thing. Like we want to educate people. We want to put people onto new opportunities, like new things. We want to tell you about yo. You should probably tap in and learn about this crypto thing. Or yo, this is what the difference between you know a business person does from a from a creator and how you know you as a creator can be better at business and so we kind of just want to put people on to different topic points that they'll be able to kind of touch on and, and move from there and so yeah no it's it's definitely a cool um an interesting platform and i want to keep going i've been learning a lot this summer um one thing that i want to do a little bit better and I always said build in public. It's something that I always want to do. Maybe maybe we should talk a little bit about building in public. Building in public is the best and only thing that you should be doing as a company. So like when we started Fits, like everyone starts their idea. When they first have their startup, you have an idea and you're like, man, this could be a really good idea that I can take on and this could be the next big thing. And so you take that idea and you might tell a few of your friends, but you don't go and share that idea and spread that idea or spread the vision of what you see. You're almost at times, and I know I was, you're scared of people taking your idea. And you're like, yo, what if someone takes my idea and doesn't blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. But the thing is, when it comes down to it, you're going to have to execute your idea. An idea is just an idea. And so there's no, there's going to be competition anyway. If someone wants to change the entire trajectory of their life to take your idea, then you're just going to have to beat them at that. And so I think in saying to people that don't know or don't want to build in public because they're scared of their ideas being taken, like show the process. And so from there, it's like when you have a company and you have an idea, right, and you're just starting out, you say you want to build this app, right? And so you have this big idea, you want to build this app, and you have all these different bells and whistles that you want to put in this app, but you don't know how to code. So what are you going to do? You want to build this app, but you don't know how to code. And so a lot of times, the first thing that you got to do is you got to build something that people want to use. And the only way of building something that people want to use is by testing that. And so the first thing you have to do if you want to build an app or build a startup, or build a company, is build a minimal viable product, build an MVP. And so what's your MVP? For Fitz, we wanted to build an app. And so we're like, yo, we want to have an app, a passion platform, a discovery, really a fashion-centric social media. 
And so one of the aspects of that app was buying and selling clothes. And so we wanted to build an app. So what's the first thing we're going to do? What is the MVP that we're going to make? And that was our website. And so now we have a marketplace where you can buy and sell clothes. And so you have to kind of test and validate your idea. And honestly, like if you have an idea for a startup, you got to get to launch pretty quick and just literally throw yourself out there, submerge yourself within the wild and just kind of build and scrap from there. And so then you'll, once you start, then you'll kind of see what problems people have. You'll figure out what you can do from there. But if you never kind of start, if you, if you sit there with that idea for a little too long, then it's not going to help you. So I think, you know, my, I guess my, my advice to everybody would be, if you see the vision and you see a big vision and you want to go and you want to do anything, start very small. And so like the one thing that I'm trying to do a lot better, the one thing I'm trying to do a lot better is start small. And so instead of, you know, always going like, oh, I have an idea to solve this. Let me just solve everything within this. Like why don't I pick a few pain points that I can do and do well in order for, you know, everything else to kind of fall in line. So I'm still trying to learn focus. I think I often want to go and attack big problems like Mac quick and just move on it. But the truth of the matter is there is a real art in the difference between focusing and the difference between kind of trying to solve too many problems. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just definitely think those are kind of a few things that I've been learning. Um, stay focused and kind of build fast and fail fast at the same time. Like we all have a lot of ideas. Why don't we try to test and validate these ideas a little bit faster? Um, but yeah, those are just a few different things that you can do if you want to, you know, start a company. So just kind of act on ideas, make ideas, inventions, and just kind of move forward um, as fast as you can. With that being said, uh, I wanted to thank y'all for, for watching episode four of Game of Power. I'll see y'all next week at 8 o'clock.